Sometimes it just feels like certain things are everywhere. Starbucks or those scooters that block the sidewalk in just about every big city now, or those ads that pop up everywhere as soon as you Google one thing that you were thinking about buying. I got the shoes already, okay, Google? Today, we'll be talking about something that is literally everywhere that you may not have heard of. Perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS for short. PFAS chemicals have made a lot of products better. They've been used in firefighting foam, food wrappers, makeup, and maybe most famously, in the original formulation for Teflon used in nonstick pans. But PFAS might be a little too good at their jobs because they don't wear down while they are used, but then even when they get thrown out, they don't go away. It's led to them being dubbed forever chemicals. PFAS have been detected in people's blood, and studies have suggested 98% of people have PFAS somewhere in their bodies. And it's been found in air, soil, and drinking water. They are also associated with some significant negative side effects if you are exposed to them at high enough levels. Those can include decreased fertility, developmental delays in children, high cholesterol, higher blood pressure in pregnant people, worse response to vaccines, and higher risks of prostate, kidney, and testicular cancers. David Andrews at the advocacy nonprofit, The Environmental Working Group, told us that you don't need to be exposed to that much of it to be at risk. The number of studies and the research going on continues to link exposure to more and more different health effects. Um, and, and I think what also stands out is these health effects and these linkages um, to, to health harm really occur at incredibly low concentrations. We don't know exactly how bad they are for you, and not everyone exposed to PFAS will necessarily develop these side effects. But we are learning more here, and there's a lot of movement to address the issue. So stay with us for a few more moments, because as bad as it may look, there are some silver linings. Advocates are aiming to find ways to break down these compounds and make sure they're not used as much in the first place. We can't just focus on destroying the chemicals once they're in the environment because the environment is already very saturated with PFAS chemicals um, and, and they stay there forever. And it's an enormous task if we think about taking PFAS out of all the water, if we think about taking PFAS out of all the contaminated communities. Um, and so uh, just having a destruction technology isn't the end solution. We also really need to uh, put less of this stuff out in the environment in the first place. That's Melanie Benish, the VP of Government Affairs, also at the Environmental Working Group. But it's not just advocacy groups working on policy solutions. We don't exactly know if and when historically large PFAS producers like DuPont, Camores, and 3M knew about the negative health effects of these chemicals, but all three know that they've reduced the levels of PFAS used in their products and committed to PFAS destruction. 3M for example, says they've invested more than $200 million toward testing and cleanup. And at the government level, the EPA has gone even further. In the last year plus, the EPA proposed a rule to require PFAS producers to turn over more data about how the chemicals are used and announced more plans to address PFAS water contamination, including $1 billion that states can apply for in grants to help remove PFAS from their drinking water. And this year, they've gone further, designating two of the most widely used PFAS compounds, often known as PFOAs and PFAS, as hazardous substances under the Superfund rules. The EPA does have some power currently to address PFAS as pollutants or contaminants, but the set of tools that they have is a lot smaller if something's not a hazardous substance. And so now that the EPA is considering calling PFOA and PFAS hazardous substances, once that's final, um, the EPA can use uh, appropriated funds. And then just generally, it'll change the way that they prioritize sites that are contaminated with these substances. And some communities are in dire need of help. We went to a town in Illinois where city officials have been working to find new water sources to protect residents from PFAS contamination. Newsy National Correspondent Ben Shamiso has more. Hi, Christian, and welcome to Freeport, a small city in northwest Illinois. The work site you see behind me is part of a huge construction site the city is financing to get rid of so-called forever chemicals in the community's drinking water. So what you're looking at is uh, well house 11 for the city of Freeport. For a price tag of $13 million, the city of 24,000 is building a new public water system 
to tap deep into new uncontaminated water sources. It's designed to produce approximately 2 million gallons per day. Freeport Public Works Director Rob Boyer says when the project is completed sometime in 2023, the city's drinking water will be entirely free of forever chemicals. How big is this of a construction project for a city like Freeport? I, I would say it's, it's enormous, but this is critical to life and health issues in the city and for its residents, and that's why it's prioritized. Ten years ago, the EPA found high levels of forever chemicals in two wells that produced about a third of Freeport's drinking water. What do you think could have been the source of the contamination? I can only speculate that it has to do with the prevalence of industry in general. Per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, or PFAS, are nicknamed forever chemicals because they don't degrade over time. This group of man-made chemicals have been used in many consumer and industrial products since the 1950s. There are over 200 different use categories ranging from dental floss to uh, clothing to carpets. The chemicals were pioneered by conglomerates 3M and DuPont. Better things for better living through chemistry. They are popular because they are resistant to water, stains, heat and oil. Good thing it's Teflon. Since they don't break down, they are now omnipresent in our environment and even in our blood. I would say that everyone in our country has them in their bodies. Scientists are now linking these chemicals to potential harmful health effects such as kidney and testicular cancers. But back in 2014, the chemicals' potential negative impacts were not as well known. Still, Freeport officials quickly shut down the two wells with the most contamination. Soon after, they put in motion plans to drill this new well and build this new treatment plant. Is protecting the, our lives here and it's protecting the residents' lives here. According to the advocacy nonprofit the Environmental Working Group, more than 200 million Americans may be drinking water contaminated with the chemicals. Freeport officials tell me their decision to completely revamp their drinking water system puts them on the leading edge of the national fight against forever chemicals. But at what cost? Like hundreds of impacted cities nationwide, Freeport is considering joining ongoing litigation against 3M, DuPont and other PFAS manufacturers. But for now, it's the residents who bear the health and financial costs caused by pollution most people don't even know exists. Ben Chamiso, Newsy, Freeport, Illinois. All right, many thanks to Ben for that story. There's been some big news on the PFAS cleanup front lately. In August, researchers at UCLA, Northwestern University, and China's Tianjin University released a new study in the journal Science that showed that PFAS can be destroyed relatively easily and inexpensively. Will Dicktel, the Northwestern professor who oversaw the study, told us how. We found that a certain type of group that is found in two of the largest classes of PFAS out there, known as a carboxylic acid, is now known in organic chemistry to be able to be removed under certain conditions. The eureka moment here was when we figured out that this reaction that was discovered a few years ago could be applied to PFAS and that then they would then fall apart into safe products. We're lucky enough to have that study's lead researcher joining us right now. Brittany Trang is now a science reporting fellow at Stat News, but this breakthrough in PFAS research was her PhD project. Brittany, welcome to In The Loop and congratulations on the PhD. You're really showing out on us today. Thanks. <laughs> the first thing I wanted to know, how exactly did you get here in your research? You know, what questions were you trying to answer with this experiment? Um, these chemicals that are very persistent, um, we've always gotten questions about after you remove them from water, what do you do with them after that? So we've said that our filter materials that we've developed are regenerable, so you can reuse them, but what do you do with the stuff that you take off the filter? So uh, we started looking at how we as chemists could enter this field that is really dominated by engineers and 
um, introduce some different perspectives to um, how to get rid of PFAS. In layman's terms, how exactly did you answer the question? As chemists, we know a lot of reactions to make certain molecules react in a certain way. And so we took some of that knowledge and um, looked at this molecule instead of being full of these fluorine bonds that are very hard to react. Um, we looked at it and saw like this other portion of the molecule that doesn't get looked at too often, the head portion, if you will, um, the carboxylic acid on the end of this molecule. And we said, hey, we know a lot of different ways to react to that. Why don't we try some of this? And um, we were able to basically cut off the head portion of this molecule. And then that left us with the tail part portion, which contains all the fluorines. And we found that we actually, when we have cut off the head, it's actually much more reactive. And with the other reagents that we had in solution, um, was able to degrade the tail portion really easily in kind of like a cascade of unzipping the fluorines off of the, off of the molecule. So because we are able to access this different reactivity that people had previously not really thought was able to happen, we were able to degrade these at much lower temperatures than normal and um, were able to degrade them to things that are benign. What's your message to people about where this research fits into the broader picture with PFAS? Um, you know, companies that might produce PFAS or use something based on this research to destroy it, uh, what should they be aware of? So because we have found a way to degrade PFAS more easily than previously thought, uh, it doesn't mean that, oh, now we can use as much PFAS as we want because we can get rid of it. Uh, because one, this is likely not going to happen anytime soon that we'll be able to degrade using this specific method. Um, but also we need to stop putting these into the environment before any sort of destruction of them becomes really, um, really valuable in the fight against them. Uh, there's lots of uh, drinking water that is contaminated with this. And because these don't break down, that is just going to build up as we continue using this, these chemicals. Brittany Trang is now a science reporting fellow at Stat News. Brittany, thank you so much for your time and sharing your research with us. Thank you.